on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of History at the University of Mississippi, author of Those Who Know, Don't Say, The Nation of Islam, The Black Freedom Movement, and The Carceral State. Professor Garrett Felber, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me on, Sam. Uh, so let's let's start with I mean, uh, the uh, one of the things I like about the title of your book is it really does uh, cover it. But it it it, it, um, it doesn't um, uh, it, it, it also raises a question in many respects. But let's just start with uh, those who know, don't say where, where is that? Um, uh, what does that refer to? So that, that title comes from a phrase um, that Muslims in the Nation of Islam would use when asked about their political engagement. So those, they would say, um, those who say don't know and those who know don't say. So the idea there was sort of that um, they were engaged in a politics um, that was strategic and often hidden from view. And then, you know, sort of the, the second half of that phrase, which is that those who were um, saying they sort of understood the Nation of Islam often were outsiders. Um, so I, I chose that title. It, it is a little um, obscure in a way that I hope draws people in because um, really that was the sort of challenge of the book for me was to try and show the ways that people might think the Nation of Islam was not politically engaged um, during the Black Freedom Movement, but uh, how it sort of did so strategically and often silently. And in, I mean, so so what was the, uh, what was the specific political agenda of the nation of Islam that it was both doing strategically and I guess to a certain extent um, maybe surreptitiously is a little bit more a little overstated but uh, in, in a low-key fashion yeah so I mean for for people who don't know the nation of Islam was a black nationalist um, religious organization um, so you know they're committed to building a black nation um, within the United States. They didn't see themselves as citizens of the U.S. Um, but in part because of the way that the state tried to repress um, the organization, they had to be really thoughtful about how they positioned their politics. So um, the majority of the men in the organization were incarcerated during World War II, um, charged with sedition for refusing to serve um, in the war, in part because they, as I said, they didn't see themselves as um, citizens. So um, based pretty much thereafter, they were surveilled by the FBI, infiltrated by local and state police. Um, and the state really tries to make this argument that the Nation of Islam is a hate group and that um, they're not, in fact, uh, sincere in their religious beliefs and that the sort of larger Muslim world rejects them. And so it was, they were sort of always positioned in a way by, by the state repression to have to make arguments of um, re religious legitimacy, of not being political, because to be political was often to be framed by the state as, um, as a hate group. And, and lots of civil rights organizations or mainstream civil rights organizations started characterizing them, especially in the 60s, as nothing but an a example of a black KKK or reverse racism or black hate. So they were sort of um, pigeonholed in this way that they had to be very strategic about when they saw, said that they were doing political work. Um, I, I want to put a, a pin in that aspect of, of how the sort of the, um, I guess the, what you call the mainstream, um, uh, mainstream uh, 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 black rights organizations were, were, attempting to sort of, uh, I guess, um, uh, characterize the nation of Islam. But let's um, talk about the, the, the relationship between the, um, I guess, in some ways, the, the, the prison abolition movement, the, um, the, the relationship to the carceral state was sort of born out of this dynamic. Yeah, so I think a lot of people don't necessarily know how influential the Nation of Islam was in terms of um, organizing inside prisons. So pretty much from this moment in the mid-1940s when Elijah Muhammad and other ministers, about 100 or so, um, constitute the largest number of Black conscientious objectors during the war, and they go to prison and actually meet um, abolitionists. And there, those abolitionists are largely associated with um, 
the Friends, the Quakers. Um, so they don't necessarily become abolitionists per se, but they're sort of part of this radical political scene in the 1940s. And, and it begins this long-term relationship with sort of organizing within prisons. And it's actually through the Nation of Islam's prison litigation um, in, the, in the late 50s and early 60s that prisoners for the first time get constitutional rights. So prior to that, uh, incarcerated people were considered slaves of the state according to the constitution. And the judicial branch essentially sees incarcerated people as solely within the purview of corrections. It's not something that they weigh in on. So it's really not until the mid 1960s with a case out of Illinois um, by a Muslim named Thomas Cooper that incarcerated people have uh, undeniably constitutional rights. And that sort of opens the door for what we see as the prisoner's rights movement. And then out of that, of course, um, this long strain of abolition. Um, explain to us what this, um, this term that you call dialectics of discipline is. I guess it's a phrase. Yeah, so it's, you know, I was trying to capture what I was seeing uh, in the archive, which was really um, a dynamic between state repression and uh, Muslim re resistance. And I kept trying to, it was sort of a chicken or the egg thing where I would see um, some sort of organized resistance by incarcerated Muslims, and then the state would sort of put a rule in place or do some sort of thing to counteract that. And then they would come up with some new form of organizing um, in response. And, and I just sort of kept tracing it back and back and back and realized, well, this isn't, this isn't linear. This is about, this is really the nature of uh, political organizing. It's dialectical. It always happens in relationship to the repression the state's doing. And so that's the dialectical part. The discipline part was kind of understanding that there's various forms of discipline. There's the state discipline, which is about coercion and repression. And then there's sort of collective and personal discipline, um, which was shown by Muslims in the nation. Um, so they would do all these things that I, that, you know, whether it was prayer or dress or refusing to, you know, do drugs or curse, um, but even at one point taking over solitary confinement. So they would purposely um, commit infractions to go to solitary confinement. And the idea was that they would take over solitary to the point where it actually became an ineffective means of punishment. So I started to see the relationship between their sort of collective discipline to do something like that and receive the state's idea of discipline, of punishment. Uh, so how would, would they take over um, um, uh, uh, solitary? Like what, what, what would be the implications just that, that because they're attempting to do that, they're sending a message that this is an ineffective punishment or what is, what, what was the, what was the theory behind that? Yeah. So the interesting thing about the takeover of the solitary is that it coincides with something that we traditionally see as a civil rights movement strategy, which is jail, no bail. So at the exact same time that in Albany, Georgia, student protesters were realizing that instead of, you know, doing nonviolent resistance, getting arrested, and then having to pay bail, which is incredibly expensive and laborious, that they would just refuse to, to pay bail and fill the jail. And then they would have to figure out, well, now we're jailing massive numbers of people that we can't hold. And this, this strategy, it's not necessarily that one informed the other, but it was sort of going on at the same time at Attica in New York. The idea was essentially, look, they only have so many solitary cells. And what they're doing is they're pulling us in and out of solitary one by one. And that disrupts organizing because one person's in solitary, one's in general population, they can't communicate. And they decided, well, if we all just force, you know, force them to hold us in solitary, then they can't put anyone else there for other disciplinary infractions. We're all there organizing. So it sort of turns the site of repression on its head and makes it a site of resistance. So I think there was an interesting parallel where they were sort of doing a similar thing that the civil rights movement was doing. And I think it raises an interesting question, which is, you know, why do we remember Albany, Georgia in the annals of civil rights history? And this strategy at Attica is completely forgotten. Well, why is that? I mean, I think it speaks to the to the invisibility of incarcerated um, organizing, right? So, I mean, we do have these moments of eruption like Attica in 1971, but this is Attica in 1961. So this organizing is always happening inside prisons, but it's, it's largely invisible. 
in part because of the nature of prisons. Prisons are to, to forcibly disappear people from our society. So this organizing that happens all the time, it's sort of like the organizing in the streets, right? We have these uprisings now, but they didn't come out of nowhere. They come out of years and decades of organizing. So Attica in 1971 comes out of the long tradition of organizing a decade earlier. How much of, uh, I mean, is that the, when, when you look at the, uh, the role of the nation of Islam in these movements, is it, um, is it, is it, is their influence through the years tactical or is there, were there elements of, uh, ideological that also crossed over into, um, the, the broader black freedom movement? I mean, I think there's all sorts of ways that we see evidence of the nation of Islam in, in movements and don't often credit it. I mean, both in terms of cultural um, and sort of black pride in hip hop and all these forms. I mean, the one that I was really trying to pull out in this book was specifically that so often we focus on particular charismatic figures within the nation of Islam, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. And we kind of look at this national level. And it's, it's about what is the relationship between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King? Or what is Malcolm saying? And then what is Roy Wilkins with the NAACP saying? And what we miss is that there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are part of this movement on the ground or in prison who are, who are organizing locally. Um, so, so, you know, I looked at in LA where there's this coalition against police brutality um, after a Muslim man is, is shot in Los Angeles in 1962. And the NAACP is working with the Nation of Islam locally. And it's only at the national level where they really start to have issues with this. So I think it, I think it really shows how when we just look at the national level, we, we miss all sorts of ways that there are coalitions happening on the ground. How much of what we're seeing today in terms of uh, Black Lives Matter, in terms of, I guess, the, um, the defund police movement and the abolition of prisons movement, how much is, um, where, where, where is the um, uh, Nation of Islam's influence the most prominent, would you say? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, throughout the movement. And it's not necessarily, I mean, one of the things that I think is important about this moment is actually many of the ways that the organizing pushes against some of the tendencies of the nation of Islam, right? Like the, the masculinism, um, you know, the sort of top-down leadership. I mean, the, the movement now is being led by queer black women, trans folks, it's, it's decentralized. So I think in some ways there's a lot of um, organizing the streets that's happening out of the lessons of that moment in the 60s that I write about. Um, but I still think there's a, there's a huge strain in, in terms of prison organizing that the Nation of Islam is, is um, responsible for and the, and the coalitional work against police. Um, like I mentioned in, in the early 60s, um, you know, they, they had a more radical critique of policing than some of these mainstream civil rights organizations in part because they were the ones who were most susceptible to it. They were, you know, being infiltrated and um, brutalized and having their mosques raided. So th I think they had a more acute sense of the, of the state violence that was happening at that time. I mean, is that where, and I guess that, that mean that gets back to the, the, the dialectics of discipline on some level, but I mean, is that where um, the, the, is that the genesis of this movement was a function of being on the, you know, specifically the Nation of Islam being on that end of, uh, of things? Or was there an ongoing movement that was then sort of joined? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think we can take any sort of one genesis point, um, you know, for all of this. But there, for example, there was, um, you know, in the, there was such a shift between the early 60s, where basically the Nation of Islam was the vanguard um, within prison organizing spaces, to even you know, 10 years later, where at Attica in 1971, you have the Young Lords Party, you have the Black Panthers, you have the Nation of Islam. Um, and these groups all have different sort of ideological analyses, um, organizing strategies. So there was a huge shift, um, even in that 10 year period, where, you know, the Nation of Islam clearly has a huge impact on something like the Black Panthers. I mean, if you look at the Black Panther 10 point program, 
it's almost identical to the nation of Islam, um, what we want, what we believe. But there's of course a whole different set of um, strategies and analysis that the Panthers have that the nation of Islam didn't. So, you know, it, there's, there's never just sort of a one clear line, but all these movements, I think, build on one another and also often build on the sort of weaknesses of these organizations. So when an, when an organization excludes people, um, you know, like SNCC excluding women leads to the establishment of a group like the Third World Women's Alliance. So I think it's important to think about some of the shortcomings of these organizations as, you know, as being beneficial as well. Um, uh, tell us about the journey of, of reconciliation. This is, um, I, I wasn't really familiar with this. And uh, Bayard Rustin was one of the people um, uh, who was involved in that. Yeah, so this is something I was, I was really interested in, um, this kind of group of abolitionists that I talked about earlier. So the journey of reconciliation is, is sort of known as the first freedom ride. So we often think of the freedom rides of 1961, of students coming down to um, the South on buses, being jailed at Parchman Farm. Um, and the journey of reconciliation in 1947 was sort of the first iteration of this. It was half black men, half white men. And the idea was to challenge the recent ruling in the Supreme Court about desegregated um, interstate travel. Um, but the sort of point that I bring out in, in this piece that I just wrote recently is that these, um, organizers who, who are sort of seen as participating in one of the real first um, desegregation, nonviolent desegregation struggles of the civil rights movement were also part of this network of prison abolitionists who had spent time during World War II with the likes of Elijah Muhammad and others in federal prisons for um, refusing the draft. So I think there's just all these ways that these movements really, you know, I often Sort of bristle at when someone says like oh the civil rights movement of our time is mass incarceration it's like you know state violence has always been the thing that people are struggling against um in these movements because it, it's the repressive arm of the state um policing and prisons are always the thing that people are are dealing with who are organizing for liberation um we talk a little bit about the role of the more uh, you know i guess so-called mainstream uh, uh black um advocacy groups you know during this time and their i guess how they uh set themselves apart from the nation of islam and and, and for what purpose yeah i mean it's so it's complicated because in part what happens really these groups tend to not um, comment on the Nation of Islam at all until 1959. And in 1959, there's this documentary by Mike Wallace later of 60 Minutes called The Hate That Hate Produced. And what they do is they ask people like Roy Wilkins and Anna Arnold Hedgeman, um, and they sort of ask them to weigh in on what they're calling the rise of Black supremacy, the Nation of Islam. So they've already framed the Nation of Islam's Black nationalism through this idea of it somehow being the opposite of white supremacy. And, you know, these civil rights organizations then denounced the Nation of Islam um, the year shortly thereafter, the NAACP actually offers a formal resolu resolution at its national convention denouncing the Nation of Islam. And eventually, when there's these coalitions that I mentioned at the local level against police brutality, they even have this really fine point plan that and local NAACP leaders have to follow um, when organizing with the Nation of Islam. They can't say that they're forming a united front. They can't let any speakers be at the rallies. So, you know, there's this real division um, between these sort of mainstream civil rights organizations and the Nation of Islam. And of course, part of it's ideological. They, they have different ideas about what um, racism and capitalism in the United States means, but also it's sort of fomented by these white liberals who, who sort of you know, drive this wedge between um, local organizers. And, 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 and it was just found to be, uh, it, it, they just quickly made them toxic on some level and, and, and sort of forced, I guess, these other organizations into a less militant uh, disposition. Is that it? Yeah. I mean, just to give a concrete example. So in Los Angeles, there's, there's this murder that I mentioned. And for a couple of months, um, in 62, after this murder, there's a Black United Front in Los Angeles. And Malcolm gives a speech where he says, 
you know, you're not brutalized because you're Baptist or Methodist. You're not brutalized because you're an elk or a Mason. You're brutalized because you're black. And it's this call to sort of understand policing at its root as, as anti-black. And this coalition starts building. And the first thing that, you know, the chief of police and the mayor try to do is to divide black groups. Um, and, and there's this recognition that that's what they're trying to do. And then after a couple of months, a hundred um, Christian ministers find something called the minister's manifesto. And what they try to do is both denounce police brutality on one hand, while also calling the nation of Islam anti-God um, and sort of this fringe group. So I think we have to recognize um, the way that the white power structure knows that dividing these groups is effective, but also the, the deep Islamophobia within communities um, that was kind of driving this, this feeling of pushing them to the side. When you look at like, you know, what, what has taken pl- place, I mean, you know, that's obviously uh, in many respects, I mean, there's been, <clears throat> there's been really years that have led up to the past month, let's say, but in the past month, there has been, as far as I can tell, the most dramatic movement that we've seen, at least in terms of like public perception of these questions and, 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 you know, some response on a political level. I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's easy to overstate it, but, uh, but, but I think at least in terms of public sentiment, things have changed um, and maybe have hit some type of critical mass. Um, is it, it, it just strikes me that there is an absence of arrows in the quiver, as it were, for the, um, the response to these movements outside of, you know, I mean, there, there seems to be like, you know, there's, there's some of the co-opting there, there's co-optation on some level, right? Like where corporations are, are now, you know, um, are, 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 or sort of like showing some type of solidarity, but the only other response apparently or, or appears to be just a violent police response, which doesn't seem to be terribly effective in terms of public opinion. But there is there isn't this sort of, um, I guess, uh, th- this this quiver full of arrows of dividing and and conquering because there doesn't seem to be the same. Um, seems that existed at that time. Does that make, yeah. does that make I sense? I mean, I think, no, it, it makes a ton of sense. And I think, I think there's both reason for optimism and for, um, you know, to be vigilant. And, and the optimism is that the same thing. So, you know, when Stokes is killed in 1962, the LA Times and the mainstream white press say this was a blazing gunfight and a riot. And, and the only people who can dispute that is the Nation of Islam, and they do it through their press and Muhammad Speaks. But, but, you know, we have the benefit now of people can watch videos and just say, look, whatever the press is saying, whatever the police are saying, I can see this just isn't true. So I think we have the benefit now of um, not having to fight on those fronts as much, um, where people can actually see the violence happening in the streets every day, rather than relying on um, these sources who are, you know, frankly, um, completely complicit. Um, but I think the, the quiver um, or the arrow that, that is, a, is a almost seamless, you know, 50, 60 year um, magic bullet for, for counterinsurgency and co-optation is reform. So this case in LA, I mean, LA was being heralded as you know, the most professional modernized police force when this happened. And then this led to Watts. And then again, it was like, oh, we'll give them SWAT teams and this and that. And it'll be the most professionalized, reformed. We'll do citizen review boards and uh, speakers bureaus. And that's always the call is reform. And I think, you know, the the reason I'm optimistic in this moment is because a lot of people are, are finally, we've done the political education work for people to know that that's not, that's not the answer. That's actually the the same thing that they've been trotting out since the beginning. But that's the thing that I think is is poised to be the most, um, you know, co-optive or, um, you know, sort of counterinsurgent in this moment is reform. Uh, So you think that the, you know, like when we talk about maybe uh, the bill that's going in Congress or, I mean, certainly the Obama administration um, had instituted, 
a program that that I, the Minneapolis Police Department was one of the, you know, um, I guess the, the, the pilot, the test cases of this extensive reform uh, project and it failed. And so uh, the biggest, the, the, the most prominent arrow you're, you, you're suggesting is in fact um, something that co-ops the energy and really doesn't end up doing anything. Yeah, I mean, the, the number one thing you'll see, right, in all of these cases is a report. So they'll fund a ton of money into a report to do, to tell us what we already know. I mean, this is what they did with Watts and Detroit and, you know, and then the Kerner Commission report comes out. And guess what? Even when the Kerner Commission told them what was wrong, they selectively listened to what they wanted to hear and what they didn't. And they wound up giving more money to police, you know? So, so what they'll do is they'll, they'll sort of filibuster for a couple of years by getting this report. And if it's anything like Ferguson, I mean, you know, the report is damning, but it doesn't mean that that results in, ab in, in actual change. It gets people out of the streets and it waits for things to quell. And the other thing that they'll do is they'll pour money back into police departments and say, you all need to do bias training or, you know, purchase more whatever. And, and it's like, that's why the, the defund the police, I mean, it means what it asks right or what it demands it's it's saying stop giving money to police to reform themselves and take that money and invest it in in black and brown communities so we have to be vigilant about that because what what both sides of the aisle are going to say is that we need more money for police we just need it to do different things and that's absolutely not what we need and and so how does that uh, uh i mean uh, i guess a, I'm asking maybe something outside of 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 your project, but um, or this this immediate project, uh, but um, let me ask it in, in including the are there lessons uh, that you have found that may be instructive uh, or uh, any other ideas about what that vigilance looks like? I mean the you know because. Uh, in the moment when you have police and, and scenes of police being this brutal uh, or in the wake of a of, of video showing, uh, you know, a, a policeman murdering somebody in front of our eyes, essentially, um, the, you know, protests and uh, clashes with the police drive um, sympathy and, and from uh, and, and sort of like some measure of solidarity from the broader society, not, not totally, but uh, to some extent, and at least meaningful enough. But if you don't have those predicates, how do you maintain that vigilance? I mean, I think, I think the thing that has to always be there, and this is why I'm, I'm, I sort of mentioned like long form when you, you draw a line and you say, no, this is just a constant struggle is the political education for people to understand because people, when we see George Floyd being murdered, some people see a bad apple and that's reformable. And some people see an example of a structure that needs to be abolished. And we need to keep people's eyes on the prize. I mean, one of the things I love, um, a good comrade, Derricka Purnell said, you know, is the justice that we're seeking, say, say with these reforms being proposed of banning chokeholds or excessive force, is the, is the thing that we call justice, George Floyd, you know, having his neck under someone's knee for seven minutes? Is it him being arrested and then thrown in jail and then, you know, put through this churn of the, of what we call mass incarceration? No, that can't be justice. So we have to think about the things that we see that are sickening and link them to larger structures, because otherwise we're just going to keep tinkering and, and trimming bushes and thinking that this is just about exceptional violence. It's not. It's about the everyday violence of the system. The whole system relies on the possibility of fatal force. That's how policing works, is that at any moment, you could be murdered by the police and that they will, that they will have absolute impunity. So that's, the police relies on violence. And we have to understand that and be vigilant about abolishing those systems and not giving those systems any more of our money. Garrett Felber, the book is uh, Those Who Know, Don't Say, The Nation of Islam, The Black Freedom Movement, and The Carceral State. We will put a link to that at majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure.